We'll continue to come in and we will probably want to be moving uh, either towards the edges on the side seats or towards the middle um, to make it a little bit easier for people to get in. Um, but I want to welcome you all to the first provocative lecture, David S. Solomon provocative lecture for the fall of 2010. Um, we look forward to doing this. The Economics Department uh, presents these and um, uh, at least twice this year we will do these lectures or uh, possibly even a debate with, uh, uh, in conjunction with another college or a department. And uh, I'm uh, extremely happy to see everybody here tonight. Uh, my name is Jack Estel. I'm a lecturer with the Economics Department. Uh, we're having a little bit of uh, difficulty with our microphone, so I'm going to talk uh, from this microphone first. Um, before I go any further, I'd like everybody to turn off their alter egos so we don't get that music right in the, music, uh, right in the middle of Ben's talk. It's, it's uh, entertaining. I know you love your, your uh, ringtones, but uh, it can be distracting. Um, so uh, let's see. After this lecture, we'll uh, have a meeting of uh, what we call the Barstool Economists. So if there's any of you who uh, would like to know more about it, any of the members of the Barstool, or people who are just curious and would like to have a drink with the lecture, we'll be meeting at Flames Eatery after this lecture, okay? Um, everybody knows where Flames Eatery is. It's on the corner of San Fernando and 4th Street. Um, this lecture series started in the fall of 2001 to foster our vision of higher education. That is challenging ideas and developing critical thinking in an environment of uh, respect for intellectual discourse. So you, our guests, are invited to relax and ponder and enjoy our guest speakers as they develop their positions on controversial subjects or a controversial stand on some subject that doesn't seem so controversial to you. We provide a question and answer period at the end of the presentation to allow the audience to engage in a respectful dialogue with our speaker, and we continue that at the Barstow meeting afterwards. Okay? And I encourage you, particularly you undergraduate students, lower division students, who don't get a chance to hang out with us, old funny dead, I'm sorry, to my speaker, I'm sorry, uh, to myself, uh, and because we have some young, funny, I mean, we also have some young professors here as well, um, to come and join us and talk to us. We're actually human, although it doesn't always seem that way. Um, uh, it's our hope that these lectures will allow uh, uh, all of us to have a more thorough understanding of the topics presented and a greater appreciation for the diversity of our opinions. Okay, it's important that we have opinions that are based on something. We're fortunate today to have Professor Ben Powell with us. Uh, from Suffolk University, where he's an assistant professor of economics. Um, he's also a senior economist at the Beacon Hill Institute in Boston. He'll be speaking to us about uh, Somalia. Many of you may know Ben from his stay here at San Jose State. We were very fortunate to have him here. And I was very fortunate to be able to both study under him and work with him on a couple of projects. Um, his research interests include economics of housing, development and economic growth, outsourcing and sweatshops, and entrepreneurship. He has published three books, including Housing in America, which is, of course, my favorite book because uh, an article that we wrote is in it. <laughs> uh, and that was edited with Randall Holcomb and Making uh, Poor Nations Rich, along with dozens of mainstream and journal economic articles. It's very well written. He has uh, participated in several tel uh, televised discussions, including a recent de uh, debate on CNBC over farm subsidies. So I'll let you guess which side he might have been on. Um, <laughs> ben has a BS from uh, University of Massachusetts Lowell and a PhD in economics from uh, George Mason University. And as I say, prior to his appointment to Suffolk, he was an assistant professor here, and uh, we continue to miss him. Uh, his topic tonight is Somalia after state collapse, chaos or improvement. Um, Somalia's formal government collapsed in 1991, and most believe that a chaotic anarchy has reigned since. Ben's research suggests otherwise, but let's not steal the thunder. And uh, so maybe you'll all help me welcome Ben Powell tonight. <laughs> Jack, thank you so much. 
Is this on? I hope so. Yeah. Can you hear it? Am I turned on? Hello. Yeah. <laughs> no, the mic's working. Uh, Jack, thank you so much. It's it's great to be back here at San Jose State. I've only been in town 24 hours. It's been fantastic with so many of my former colleagues. Uh, but it's been great to see whether from, from economics, from the basketball, the new time basketball group, the Salzburg scholars, um, or colleagues, or just people who are in the office next door to me and probably heard me loudly cursing occasionally when I'm mad at something. Well, um, it's great to see you all. Uh, I'm pleased to be back here in particular to talk in the Dave Sauerman uh, lecture series. Uh, it's a provocative lecture series, so I did suggest this topic for, for some other ones that I give public talks on. But in one sense, I don't think this one is particularly provocative. To foreshadow a little bit, what I'm going to explain is how Somalia has actually done better since its state collapsed. So they have been in a state of anarchy as a no government overall ruling group, ruling the geographic territory, but they have had a form of governance, systems of rules and enforcement that have allowed them to build more prosperity than when they had a government. And the reason I don't think it's that radical in or provocative in this context of Somalia. When you look at how bad many African nation states are, the idea that you get rid of one of these predatory vampire states that's sucking the lifeblood out of its people, and then they suddenly do a little bit better, I don't think it's all that controversial. I mean, does anybody doubt that the Chinese would have done better without a government than when they had not? Uh, Barr is just basically pretty low. Um, so with that in mind, though, I'd like to get into this and kind of describe the situation that's gone on there how they've done, and then some of the problems and challenges that they still face. Because also, I don't want to make it sound like some <coughs> utopia or whatever. They're still desperately poor and have a very low standard of living. And while life expectancy is improved, it's still a short life. It's not a great place, but the question is, how does it do without the state compared to when it had one? And then let's think about what type of states it's likely to get in the future and what implications this might have for other African countries. So it used to be that most people, when I say something about Somalia, immediately would think of Black Hawk Down, either the book or the movie, and extrapolate from that that the chaos and fighting in Mogadishu was widespread throughout the country, and therefore it must be anarchy in the sense of chaos. Uh, now, more than likely, to bring up Somalia, someone says pirates, uh, whether it's even like Cartman on South Park who wants to be a pirate in the building. Uh, so it's changed a little, and I will get into pirates later on. So in Somalia, we have to kind of think about some different time periods and what's happening here. So the government collapses in 1991, um, when Saeed Bear is thrown out of power. Immediately, rival warlords plunge the country into fighting as they buy to become the next national government. Uh, and I don't think this is that surprising that they all would. If you look at the history of Somalia, its whole experience with governments ruling it was, it ruled for the benefit of the ruling elite and extracted resources from the other clans and the poorer people in rural regions. So that was true when it had its own independent state, and then, to a greater or lesser extent, it was also true whether it was the Italians or the British who were ruling it before that. So their expectation is, when they get a new government, it's not going to be some constitutionally limited government that tries to protect their property rights or whatever. No, it's going to be a predatory state that rules for the benefit of the rulers and his associated clan. So as a result, they all had a big incentive to make sure that they were the clan that became in charge. Uh, so during this time, from 93 through 95, there's a lot of this warring going on. This is when we have the... I like to kind of say so-called humanitarian interventions by the UN and the United States. It's always curious when humanitarian interventions involve sending in soldiers with guns. Um, and 1995, we finally have the withdrawal of US and UN forces after the famous Black Hawk Down incident where there was a violent clash and the US decided to withdraw. But a funny thing happened after that. After the US and UN withdrew, the prospect of any one of these rival plants having enough power to become the new government kind of dissipated. Nobody expected another one was going to become the next government. As a result, they stopped fighting with each other. Not, not entirely. There was still private crime. There was still occasional little outbursts, but it was no longer a widespread civil war going on. Since then, it's had periodic bouts of fighting that burst out, and there's one going on right now. Um, and it's always centered around when there's a new government created in exile, and it comes into the country to try to claim power. And when it does, the other clans pop up and go to war with them. And as a result, you get the, the messy fighting that's centered mostly around Mogadishu of what's going on today with the transitional federal government. So they had a lot of these government, governments in exile. It was about four or five years ago now that uh, what's called the transitional federal government uh, was set up in exile. It came into the country, um, backed by Ethiopian troops mainly. Now it's uh, African, uh, Union, African Union troops who are there. But 
interestingly, when the Ethiopian troops come in, Ethiopia is the long-hated neighbor of Somalia, so everybody took this even more so as a foreign invasion. Uh, and that's what a lot of the fighting centered around now. Uh, I do, in my analysis, what I'm going to talk about, talk about statistics from Somalia and living standards for the entire country. Uh, because I consider the entire country in a, period, a place of statelessness. Technically, on paper, uh, although nobody else recognizes it, they claim that there are two governments in this area. Uh, so one is put land along this coast, and this is actually where most of the piracy comes out of, and Somali land up in the north. Uh, but as best I can tell, they don't do anything that you think of as being a government. Uh, what would you say the essential features are of a government? What does it take for something to be government? Protect property rights. Protect property rights. Okay. Security. Provide some public goods. Tax, Tax. someone said. Coercion. Coercion. Okay. So I'd say kind of like a mix. <laughs> um, is that to be a government, you have to be the monopoly in the geographic territory of ultimate dispute resolution and use of force. And with that comes your ability to tax to fund it, maybe. And maybe you do provide public goods. But you know what? There's plenty of governments that don't really provide anything but public acts. But I still call them a government. They're a geographic monopoly that ultimately decides all disputes or claims to have the ability to be the final arbitrator of all disputes. And usually would protect property rights in their evil. So these Cook Land and Somali Land don't do that. So there's no judicial system there. They don't enforce any property rights. They don't enforce any contracts. They don't police. They do collect a little bit in taxes, but it ends up being about $1 per capita per year. It's basically just a shakedown racket, as far as I can tell. And they don't do anything that you think a government would do. My best interpretation of them is that they exist on paper in the hopes of being recognized. Because once you're recognized internationally, then it's okay that you can have aid flows directly sent through your government. You can get official government aid, government to government aid. And then you have something to see. But no one has recognized them internationally yet, so they're not really doing that. In fact, the pirates have seemed to be better at stealing official aid because they do it off the coast. Um, true, actually, I kind of snicker when they raid World Bank ships uh, or World Bank products. Um, but uh, these so-called states really don't seem to exist. I did try to meet, by the way, the uh, president of Puntland one time. It's the one time I went into a congressional office uh, since I was like little. I was in D.C. for the month of June this year and last year. And one of my students in class said, oh, do you know the president of Puntland is doing a hearing? I'm like, oh, so how do you go to a hearing? Because I don't even know how to do this. And uh, so they tell me you go, and it was just a hideous experience. It was June in D.C., so it's like human and a bazillion degrees outside. And I have to stand in this line to get in a building with a bunch of people that they can't even remember the slogans they're supposed to lobby about, so their T-shirt like says it for them, you know, help care now or save my job or something. It's despicable. I finally get inside the building, and then the hearing room, apparently pirates became sexy in the meantime, so everybody in the world wanted to go to this talk, and this is the line on the car, so I never get to meet the guy. Uh, anyway, I was hoping to. But he's kind of like the king in Monty Python who goes around and says, like, I'm your king, and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> it doesn't do anything in the country. Uh, all right, so what I think is interesting, to some extent we can talk about competing kind of political theories of what a state of anarchy would look like by observing one in Somali states. Rare that you actually have instances of completely lack of a government, you know, or you have ineffective governments in any place, but complete statelessness is not particularly common in widespread regions. Uh, certainly in pockets and mountainous aid areas and stuff like that. But uh, there's a chance to kind of look at competing theories of Hobbes and Cannon and Olson who basically say in a state of nature without a government, everyone's going to brutalize each other, life's going to be nasty, brutish, and short. Or others like uh, Murray Rothbard or David Friedman from Santa Clara University who's written on this about how between competition between protective agencies, you could actually have a stable type of anarchy that provides better property rights and freedom than even under a government. Somalia doesn't conform to either of these type of theories perfectly, uh, far from it. Uh, the real perspective that I take on is a comparative institutional one. So the question is not, what does an ideal anarchy versus a bad anarchy look like, or an ideal state versus an anarchy look like, or any of these? The question is, given level of development, culture, history, natural resources, etc., that Somalia has, how is it likely to perform under its type of anarchy, and how is it likely to perform under the type of government it is likely to get? That's the comparative institutional question, the one that's relevant for real world policy, uh, and the one that I'm going to take in the talk today. So, First, getting just a little bit of background of what I kind of call the government failure of what was happening under government in Somalia. Uh, so they practice so-called scientific socialism. Uh, quite frankly, uh, I certainly don't know what's scientific about it, but I also don't really know what was really socialist about it either, per se. Uh, it was mostly 
They wanted to claim socialism so that they could get military aid from the Soviet Union, which they did until they went to war with another Soviet satellite, Ethiopia, and then they got cut off, and coincidentally abandoned socialism, which meant they didn't change any policies from before. Uh, what they did have during it was land nationalization and redistribution, but this was more about shuffling populations around the country to aid in the power of the current ruling regime than it was some ideological land reform under Mao or something like that. Uh, public goods provision. So the government, in the last years that it was in operation, 90% of all spending was on defense and administration. And some of you might think, oh, you know, I took an economics class and I learned about public goods. And like, kind of the ultimate example that economists give of public goods would be national defense. So they're doing that, right? What was the problem here? Somalia wasn't at war with anybody. This was government spending on national defense to defend the government from its own people. That's not a public good. That's a public bad. Uh, spending on social services for the people, less than a percent of GDP. But really what you have going on is basically just a wealth transfer system from the rural people to the elites in Mogadishu. So you've got about 66 65%, two-thirds of the economy basically uh, produced in the rural pastoral sector, but they only get 6% of government spending. It was about extracting resources for them before Mogadishu. Uh, Informal black market employs close to three-quarters of the labor force. And this isn't just like drug activity, black market that you think of in the United States. It's banking, finance, dispute settlement, health, education. These are black market activities that are going on or informal sector activities. So I kind of told you about the three distinct periods. Uh, maybe I wasn't explicit about the last one. The first is the Civil War period. The next, from 95 to 2006, while you had the little clerics of fighting when an occasional government in exile was created, they were temporary and short-lived. What you have from 2006 to the present is when the transitional federal government went into the country and tried to expand power, which, by the way, they are hard pressed to control uh, much of Mogadishu, let alone the rest of the country. So outside of that small area, they still don't really have that much strength. Um, so let's take a look at what happened. So my research, by the way, when I give you statistics on this, this is a paper I published a couple of years ago now, um, ends in 2005 for the statistics part of it. So I'm looking at basically how living standards changed in 2000, uh, from 1995, well, from the 80s and 90s in particular, but up to 2005. After that, I don't really have good data, and I should put up some caution on this. All data, well, actually, all data everywhere is suspect, particularly from Africa and maybe particularly from Somalia. Uh, but that said, it's the best we've got. So let's take a look at it, and we'll also look at more ethnographic type of evidence and see uh, if it goes hand in hand, kind of. Uh, so rural pastoral sector. Uh, and this is actually, these stats aren't based off of uh, official statistics or anything. This is actually an anthropologist from the University of Kentucky who did a lot of field work there, both in the 80s and in, in the late 90s. Uh, the Garissa export market. Uh, so this is a Kenyan market for cattle sales. Uh, volume increases by 400% uh, while sales do as well. This is from 1989 to 1998. So compared to the last years of the state, compared to the middle part of their stateless period, big increase in the cattle export and sales there. Uh, the, in the north, then, it's a different port, so it's not just like a regional shift here. In the north, Basasso and Barbera, uh, they exported 95% of all the goats, 52% of all the sheep in East Africa. It was larger in volume in 1999 than any time when they had a state. And interestingly, as a uh, think thinking about property rights and security, in those export markets, it's not just Somali cattle that are being exported, it's actually landlocked Ethiopia in some cases, people who are bringing their cattle and herding them across northern Somalia and out of the ports. Uh, mostly to uh, Middle Eastern countries or other places. Uh, so there's some indication that people feel secure enough that they can cross through Somalia and do this. Um, there was a drought where they took a little bit of a hit, uh, but they performed compared, you know, compared to Kenya and other neighboring countries. When we look at what happened to security, uh, to move animals, it cost about one cent per kilometer move per animal. Uh, basically, they hired private guards to go with them. But when they surveyed the cattle herders about this, only 26% of them thought that this was a problem, and only 13% thought it was more of a problem than it was back when it had a state, because the state really wasn't providing much security anyway. They also have another interesting way in which they provide some of their kind of security when they herd cattle. So while you have armed guards that help you when you herd the actual cattle to an export market, after you sell, instead of taking your money home with you, you do a wire transfer and send it to a bank back where you're at home so you're not like traipsing across the land with a bunch of money on you. Um, so that's no, another way they kind of self-protect. Uh, because you know they don't want to really steal all your cattle. Cattle are kind of big to move around. So the money is easier. Uh, although actually, Somali shillings, as we'll see, you kind of need a lot of them too. Uh, <laughs> but it's an interesting case of money. Uh, I'll get there. So urban and commercial activities too. So it's not just like so. In some sense, the rural pastoral sector like seeing it expand isn't that surprising. It was expert, had wealth expropriated from it under the state. The state disappears. It does a little bit better. Okay. 
How about urban areas? So there's actually major companies that have gone and made investments in Somalia. So Dole Fruit, Coca-Cola, they opened up a 35,000 bottle a day plant outside of Mogadishu. Uh, DHL, if you want to make deliveries there, you can send a DHL package. Uh, affiliates of GM, BBC, and British Airways all operate inside of Somalia. Uh, then just to pick one city where you could actually get reasonable statistics on and look at what happens in that city, Borama. Uh, population's 150,000, 300,000. Depends on the season, basically, if the nomadic herders are in town or not in town. Um, and you can find out what type of things they have in the city. They have 95 tea shops, 90 restaurants. Interesting, eight of them have international star ratings. Uh, 145 elementary shops, wholesalers, retailers, 16 hotels, again, four of them, international star ratings. The fuel stations is interesting, too. 18 fuel stations, but seven of them uh, would be fuel stations not entirely unlike what you see out on Santa Clara Street. It's fuel stations where you actually have pumps and underground tanks. But this is indicative of some security of property rights there. In many places, in Somalia, for that matter, in many places in Africa, if you're going to sell fuel, you might send it, sell it out of a tanker truck or out of a 55-gallon drum. In that case, if your property rights become insecure, you can quickly move your valuable products to life. Here, you're using underground storage tanks, which says that they're confident enough that no one's going to come there and expropriate the wealth out of their tanks. Uh, airport, couple hospitals, university with 100,000 books. Um, these things are all interesting, but we really want to try to get a picture of overall living standards. So myself and one other guy were both studying Somalia at the same time. In fact, when we became interested in it, I was working for San Jose State, and we were interviewing job market candidates at the Southern, which gets rather, interviewing job market candidates gets rather tiresome, period, uh, when everyone comes in and wants to tell you about their dissertation, especially when you keep asking questions and then they answer questions about the world. Well, in my dissertation. Uh, so during one of the breaks in that interview process, I read uh, a World Bank report, which is a little free pager, and it was about Somalia, and they only had a couple of statistics in it, but these World Bank economists were saying it's not as bad as people think, and it's actually been doing better. And that got me interested in the topic, including one of the other guys that we interviewed that year, Peter Leeson, who's gone on to do some great things. Uh, the two of us both got interested in the topic and started working on it in different angles. What he did is he looked at 18 different indicators where you could look at World Bank, World Health Organization reports from basically the 85 to 1990 period, and then again from the 2000 to 2005 period, and look, when they have these same reports from both years, what happened? Are they doing better or worse than the metrics that they're measuring in those? Out of them, we find 13 improved, two or worse, three were kind of indeterminate. We couldn't really tell. And I think that's interesting and good, particularly for Africa, but also the part of me that thinks about it, well, you expect a country, you know, this is 20 years later. If you're not entirely messed up, you should be better off 20 years later. Although, in sub-Saharan Africa, that's not necessarily the norm, so this isn't important finding, and it does indicate that it's not going into complete chaos. What I did is looked at it relative to 42 other sub-Saharan countries, or about 42 other sub-Saharan African countries, and see, well, okay, it's improved, but has it improved as fast as the normal, less fast than the normal, or what <coughs> what's going on? So, that's what we have here. This gives you your absolute ranking of these things that are going to score on them. This is telling you your relative ranking among the 42 other sub-Saharan African countries in 2005, 1990, 1985. What you see on that when you look at this is that Somalia still is a poor place, and in many of the things, it's near the bottom in Africa or the middle. Some of them it does pretty well. But what we haven't seen in them is for those that we can get stats from 1990 and now, is a drop off of them falling behind. They've usually improved, poor state bad at what they were already bad at. Where we see a drop off is under the last years of their government where they were continuing to get worse. So things like death rate and life expectancy, uh, you see that they do fairly well among the group, although still desperately poor place, 47 years is the average life expectancy there. Uh, but they were ranked among countries a little bit better than the middle of the pack, 18. But under the government, they were 37th, near the bottom, 34th. They actually, other than, there's only three other countries in Africa who have had a bigger increase in life expectancy over this time period as Somalia. Um, Infant mortality, they're near the bottom of the pack at, but they were before too. Um, big area of success in Somalia is telephone lines and telecommunications. And this is not actually a trivial thing. So what its main reason for success is most governments in Africa put limits on telephone competition and either have a state-owned monopoly or a state-sanctioned monopoly. As a result, you can look up like uh, the Doing Business Index from the World Bank and see that it takes years sometimes to have a telephone line installed in your house or your business in an African country. So there's just no competition for this, or sometimes no even profit mode. In Somalia, there's no government to tell you you can't do it. So anybody can throw up telephone lines who wants. Anyone can throw up cell phone power who wants. Um, so as a result, the economist ran uh, an article about four years ago now, and it was called Calling Somalia. 
And their claim is that Somalia has the clearest signal and the cheapest rates in all of Africa for cell phone service. Now, when you think about that, though, there's an externality problem that goes on here. You have frequency bans if you're going to be transmitting on cell phones. So you need property rights over airwaves where you don't have people infringing on the signals of others. So this isn't just competition pushed down price because everybody could throw up towers. That in itself is cool. But they've also managed to do it in a way where they're not competing on each other's frequencies. That's a, I'm actually, by the way, I don't have a good explanation of exactly how they did it, but that's another paper. Um, <laughs> if someone wants to go get the data. Um, but they've managed to do that. This is like a classic externality problem that they're overcoming. So this is like a tough case for competition. Um, where it doesn't like the United States or whatever, you have the FCC who regulates which frequencies who can transmit on. Uh, so cell phones uh, and mobile and main lines are both good. Internet users is fairly good. Of course, these things don't go back to 1990 because only Gordon Gecko had a phone back then. Uh, <laughs> Immunization rates, it's near the bottom of the pack, but it was near the bottom of the pack when it had a state and the drop off that occurred while it had a state there. Um, tuberculosis, uh, I don't know, 25% range, uh, but it's been bad before, so they've actually improved a little bit there. Uh, it is a semi-arid country, so improved water sources up there, sanitation. So what we're seeing, like, overall the picture here is that there are a lot of things that it's worse than the African average on, but a lot of things it's better on, particularly the most important of all of these, I'd say, is life expectancy, but that, for the most part, improvements occurred since they lost their state. And to the extent that they're poor and have problems, they already had them before that happened. So this is just comparative institutional and the change. So this is actually one of the cases where when you, uh, students, when you submit like your research to journals, then they send it out to anonymous referees who basically can tell you whatever they want you to do with your article, and then the editor decides if he likes that. And then you have to do obnoxious stuff that's really irrelevant quite often to satisfy and get it published. This case was actually one where they helped me. Uh, one thing that one of the reviewers said, he said, well, that's fine, but the author claims that that's me, uh, claims that uh, they had a relative peace between 2000, 1995 and 2005. How much of this is just the fact that Somalia was at peace, so they improved relative to warring African nations? Uh, which at first I kind of snickered at, I'm like, come on, really? Uh, then I looked up how many African nations could claim to be continually at peace since 1990. Uh, the sample switched from 42 to 17. Um, so there were only actually 17 countries continually at peace in Africa. Which, by the way, part of my response to the referee, this time worked out the way it did, would have been that in and of itself is an achievement and is relevant for their living standards and proof. <laughs> However, it also still works out that basically when you compare it just to those ones who had been at peace during this time from 1990 on, story magnitude changes slightly, but basically all the same categories shake out pretty much the same. But that's kind of stacked in the deck against Somalia because from 1990 to 1995, they were warring. So what I did then, he didn't ask this, but I added it in, uh, was compare them to countries that had, five countries that basically had wars at about the same time. Uh, and then see how they improve relative to them. Now when you do relative ranking with only five countries, you don't get much movement, so it wasn't too interesting. So I did percent changes, what's the five country percent change over this time, versus what's the Somali average over the time. And you see, for the most part, Somalia outperforms them there. Uh, infant mortality is the one that it does not. Um, but otherwise, and by the way, these things like the immunization ones, are the ones where they rank poorly, but they're still, making big improvements in immunization over this time, and they're doing it faster than this country's or this group's average. So the question is, how do they do this? So fine, it's nice to tell a story about living statistics improving, but absent the state that provides, like basically for markets to work, you need a bedrock of property rights and contract enforcement. If you don't have that, if you don't have property rights, you don't have the gains from trade to come from. So if they don't have a government that's doing this, how do they do it? How do they provide complex goods and services and so-called public goods that get them the foundation to start improving. Um, so some of these things they call slightly complex, but I would call them really the foundation ones, like air travel, just kind of cute how they do it. Uh, 50, per, 50 <coughs> firms, 60 planes, 60 international routes. Uh, that's up from one national carrier and one international route in 1989. And the interesting thing with how they do uh, safety certifications, since there's no like uh, FAA or whatever to certify them there, what they do is they fly their planes to other countries and they get certified as safe to be in those other countries and they use the same planes with inside Somalia. Uh, and then of course there's uncertified planes as well. Uh, the banking system, and this is the Somali chili thing that I talked about before. They have an interesting banking system, a Hawala funds transfer system, now the numbers are close to a billion dollars annually when I first put this together, it was a half billion to a billion annually, that it does as funds transfers. Some of these are transfers coming from abroad back to Somalia. 
others are within Somalia wiring money to make payments for each other and wiring, like I mentioned, the hers, wiring money to yourself so that you don't have to travel with a lot of cash. And there's no like government issued IDs for this. With what you do with the Holala system is you ask a series of questions or you give a series of questions with answers when you transfer the money. And then when someone comes to pick it up, they have to be able to successfully basically pass the test. Um, usually it's based off clan lineage, family, or something like that. Actually, one time I said this when I was first working on this paper with a class when I taught international economics at San Jose State. They had uh, a number of the, uh, what's known as the Lost Boys from Sudan, came to San Jose State at the time. And I had a number of them in my class who were always fascinated to have the class when I talked about African development issues. I really liked them. One of them immediately kind of went, but Professor, Sudan has a government and we have to do that. <laughs> um, but what's interesting with the Somali shilling system here, so, what's your dollar's worth? What's a dollar worth? How do you know what the value of the dollar comes from? The government tells us what it's worth. The government doesn't tell us what a dollar's worth. What do we buy? What do we buy, right? All, all that a dollar's worth is what someone will give you for it. It's not like tied to gold or precious metal. No. It's a piece of paper. Your value of a dollar completely depends on your expectation that somebody else will take that dollar in exchange from something, right? That's all it comes from. Well, guess what happened in Somalia? The government collapsed, but people didn't change their mind that they still expected others to take Somali shillings and pay them for this. So they kept using it. But now, you had no national government who could tell you <coughs> no counterfeiting those pieces of paper. So, immediately, people start hitting the printing presses, and they print a lot of Somali shillings. There were really three or four major ones who were doing this, but I'm sure there was smaller operations as well. And they print tons of Somali shillings. Well, pretty quickly, they go into a very high rate of inflation. But people's expectations were that they would only take so-called real Somali shillings. They didn't like check to see which ones were real. But they knew that the maximum denomination was a thousand Somali shilling note. Well, these counterfeiters started trying to make five thousand Somali shilling, ten thousand Somali shilling, and no one would take them. <laughs> so they didn't count as part of the money. But what they did do is they kept printing five hundred Somali shilling notes, a thousand Somali shilling notes, until it was no longer economical to put print 500 Somali shilling notes. As a result then, you get everybody to make 1,000 Somali shilling notes. And they do this, but damn, it becomes unprofitable. It's basically, they exchange for about the equivalent of three to four cents. Three to four cents for 1,000 Somali shilling notes. Well, that approximately equals the paper, ink, and transport costs of creating Somali shillings. <laughs> so they stopped inflating. So as far as I know, the case of the Somali shilling, I've run this by a lot of monetary guys, Jeff. I've never heard someone give me another example. This is the only purely 100% backed and embodied commodity currency of paper. <laughs> but the key here, right, is what you want from a money is stability in its value, right? You want it for a unit of account for economic calculation. Roughly any quantity of money can be optimal within certain bounds, I suppose. But really what you want is stability. Well, guess what? Since 1997, they've had stability. It's three to four cents. Always stays that way. Stable unit of account, doesn't induce business cycles, doesn't create clusters of errors. <coughs> Works as a monetary unit with yeah, relative ease. Now what it's not good for, of course, then, is making big purchases. If you make big purchases, you know, you're letting the stuff in the front, getting the dump truck. Uh, so, but there's also no one there who has exchange rate controls or currency controls. You can freely use dollars or euros or whatever. So basically, they become de facto dollarized for bigger purchases. And for smaller purposes in accounting, they use Somali shillings. Works out pretty well. Uh, really cool instance, I think. Uh, roads, which I don't know why people think of roads as public goods, really. We have tons of examples historically and currently of privately provided and financed roads. Uh, but anyway, there's statistics on it. About 3,000 kilometers per thousand of population. Roughly the same as neighboring countries in that area. So they're not really creating that many new ones. They're maintaining what they got. Okay. Social insurance, maybe I'll come back to this one in a second. They do, so they don't, there's no social security or Medicare or anything like that for you there. But they basically use traditional um, kind of networks to provide social insurance, where you have a social insurance group based off your paternal great grandfather. And the custom is that when you come into hard times, one of the other people in the group or collection of the group tries to help you out until you get back on your feet. Um, I'll explain more about that in a second when I talk about the kind of real underlying how they provide the, the bedrock, the property rights and rule of law that gets them going. Um, so in some cases in urban areas, they do have just what we call regular private security provision where you hire 
armed guards or whatever for your business, which if you've traveled in Africa or for that matter, many poor Latin American places, you see this in plenty of places that have a government, stores still have to hire their own armed private guards that stand outside. Um, and for that matter, even in the United States sometimes, they just usually don't have big machine guns. Uh, so, economists reported taxes payable to a local tenant of authority or strong man seldom more than 5%. Security costs, another 5%. 10% uh, doesn't even, what, that barely gets you up to California's take from an average citizen here in the federal government. Um, so they have some of that, and as I mentioned, little showing the rural security costs really haven't changed. The real interesting thing is how they provide law and order and the kind of framework that everything else takes place on. So they have what we call a clan elder dispute resolution system, which it's fairly, I don't know if I would call it unique. It's got a lot of desirable characteristics about it uh, that make it a particularly good dispute resolution, kind of indigenous dispute resolution system. So the basic level, and the easiest one that most people see, if there's two members of the same clan and you have a dispute, you turn to your clan elder, you both make your case to them, and they give their ruling, and then you're obligated to abide by it. There's no like, jail to send you in. So it's a restitution-based system. So this is pretty much common to all customary legal systems or spontaneously evolved legal systems in the world. Because the reason is jail's kind of inefficient. <laughs> you stick someone in there, they're not creating value, and meanwhile, the victim wasn't made whole. When you see spontaneously evolved legal systems, it's almost always restitution-based. So it's restitution-based. The plan elder basically says, you did something wrong, you pay him this much. And actually, technically, by legal code, everything's dictated in cattle. You owe him this much cattle. In principle, they, in practice, excuse me, they pay in money. Because uh, it's easier than like lopping a half a cattle or something. Uh, but their, their legal code actually pre specifies your payment penalties for all sorts of transgressions. It's really rather specific, too. Like right now, you get into a fight with somebody and they lose the use of their arm. Oh, that's so many cattle. Oh, it's the left arm, that's less. Um, as apparently, most people are right handed. Um, they also have different penalties for murder, of how much you have to pay if you murder someone. Obviously, you don't pay the person, you pay the family. Uh, but they have different prices for old men versus young men. Um, presumably because they figure the future income stream of the young man is going to be greater, so you hurt his family more than if it was an older man who wasn't going to produce much more anyway. Uh, ditto differences between males and females in what they charge for these things. So that's what happens though within your plan. Now, there's not many people out there that take much imagination to think, that, of course, within plan you could have this type of dispute resolution system. Where it gets more creative is when you go outside of it. How do you get it? We're going to have economic growth and prosperity. You need the extended order of being able to deal with a lot more people. So what happens there is if I'm a member of one clan, Brian's a member of a different clan, we have a dispute, and I pick Brian on purpose because he's a lawyer. Uh, Brian <laughs> will then turn to his clan elder, and I'll turn to my clan elder. The two of them get together, and they try to mediate the dispute. If they come to an arrangement, they make their ruling, we're all obligated to abide by it. If they can't come to an agreement, they appoint a third-party clan. And whoever that third-party elder is, gives his ruling, and we're obligated to abide by that. And it's not like an appeals process, though. There's not like a pyramid of hierarchy that you go through where A and B have a dispute, A, plan A, plan B have a dispute, so they go to C, and then if A and D do, they go to C. No, there's no like overarching one. If A and D do, they might go to G, or they might go to B. It's not hierarchical in how you have to go up. Um, so as a result, there's no one plan that's the ultimate uh, disputer of the, of the law. Uh, what happens if you have a, so in this case then, uh, each individual plan, basically, as they're picking third-party plans they can both agree to that they'll turn over, they're expecting that that person has a good understanding of the law, of what actually they call it customary law for a reason. It's custom. They have a good understanding of what custom is, and then they're going to try and decide how do the facts of this case fit with the custom, and then I'm going to make the rule. If you start systematically deviating from what custom is, then people will stop coming to you to be the third-party arbitrator. This is both true of when plans A and B need a third-party plan to arbitrate, and also true within the plan who's selected to be the elders and the judges. If you start making rulings that people feel are not in line with the community custom, they'll stop being asked for your rulings, and they'll pick a new plan elder to hear these cases. So this is telling you how the law changes there. There's no like legislation that passes a new law in Somalia. The way the law changes is common custom changes. As common custom changes, it gets codified in law as judges make or elders make rulings on these things. And if the judges don't keep up with how custom is changing, then they are no longer considered to be the judges that should hear the cases. How about enforcing the verdicts? So there's no jail, there's no police force. So you say, you know, Ben, you're guilty, you owe him five cap. I don't want to pay up. Well, if I don't pay up, my 
social insurance group is obligated to pay it. So based off my paternal great-grandfather, the people who are in that group have to pay on my behalf. Once they pay on my behalf, they're rather pissed off at me. And they want to extract payment from me or give me other social sanctions. So if you want to be in good standing in your community and with your clan, you need to make your payments. Ultimately, if they really get unhappy with me because I'm continuously a jerk who makes them pay for me, then they create that we, they basically create uh, make me a quote outlaw. They say he's no longer part of our insurance payment group. He's no longer part of our clan law. He is literally outside the law. Once you're outside the law, that means anybody can do anything they want to, because there's no repercussions. You're not part of the law. So if you want to just punch me, kick me, whatever, that's fine. You can steal from me. No repercussions. Being an outlaw is not a good thing. So like think about like outlaws of Sherwood <coughs> Forest. The reason they hang out in the forest, if you're in society, they're going to kick you out. Uh, you got to get away from people. So outlaw is basically like a death sentence. You ultimately get uh, death sentence or really run very far away sentence. Um, so this is how they enforce it. Now here's what's the cool thing of why this doesn't become like a de facto uh, government in your clan. Because uh, you might just say, well, it's like a government, except you know instead of elections, they use custom based off who they're picking to be their elders or whatever. There's actually competition for the governance. So if you decide you don't like your clan elder the way you've been ruling, not just on your cases, but on anybody's, you're free to leave and pick a new clan if you want. If that new clan will take you, you can become one of their members. And then if you have a dispute, it goes through their clan elder network. Except here's the thing. I use the word go. You don't actually have to go. You stay right where you are. They're not geographic enough. <coughs> All of these individual clans are completely intermingled, and they move among each other. So it's not like clan A has this land. And if I don't want to be part of plant, you know, actually, it's not. I don't want to be part of California law. I don't. I go to Nevada, and then I can, you know, get a prostitute or whatever in school. <laughs> no, this would be like, no, actually, I'm going to stay right in San Jose, and I would like prostitutes, so I'll just get Nevada law here. <laughs> That's basically what they do in Somalia. So you change, it's like changing from Visa to Mastercard or whatever. You switch your subscription for your legal dispute, and then I'm living right here. You were living right there, Brian. You're still the same place, right? But I have a new plan than before. Now when we have a dispute, we go to a different third party guy to arbitrate because I'm in a different plan. So now you actually have competition for legal services between the different plans trying to get people in. And people are free to move between them without having to go through the transactions plus and actually changing physical residence. That's why I don't think these plans can be classified as actually geographic monopolies. And switching plans, uh, at least the legal aspect of it, is quite common. Um, Often people do it with marriage anyway, but people also do it for legal reasons. So this is kind of the foundation that they use to provide a system of regular law and its enforcement. And the result has been that compared to when they had a predatory state, they've been able to do a little bit better. Um, so the Zier is the name of their customary law. D is their payment system. And if some of you have studied a little bit more law, some of them might sound familiar. There's a lot of things in common with like old style English common law before the crown continually intervened in it to make things that were crimes against each other crimes against the crown, and then turning things that were crimes, since they were crimes against the crown, that means now if you do it wrong, you have to pay a fine to the king. Now all of a sudden people stop prosecuting things because they weren't getting any return from prosecuting, and all of a sudden you find, oh wait, we have a public goods problem. It wasn't that the law was a public goods problem to start with, it's when you separate the restitution from breaking the law from it, it becomes more of a public goods problem, and then it justifies the government policing and taking over of other things there. So it's not inherently unable to be produced like this. So you can look at whether it's Icelandic law when they were in an American state, or earlier English common law, or other spontaneous state law laws. You see a lot of similarities there. Uh, they did have Muslim courts, so there's a Council of Islam courts that gets a lot of press from Somalia, uh, but they really weren't part of this legal system. Uh, Islamic law was basically used for matters of divorce and inheritance. That was about it. The Council of Islamic Courts that became powerful became really a de facto government around Mogadishu at the time the TFG, the transitional federal government, came into Somalia. Basically, they were just a focal point of resistance to the invaders. But in becoming the focal point of everyone's resistance, they became kind of a geographic monopoly in Mogadishu and were a particularly repressive, nasty government themselves. Um, but eventually, the TFG and their allies broke up the Council of Islamic Courts and now these are the people who are classified as terrorists in Somalia who, create, uh, who do acts of violence against the TFG, but they're not a formal government anymore, really. Uh, the big public good of national defense. 
Well, they've kind of done it, haven't they? We've had seven different governments in exile. None of them has even been able to control the capital city, let alone less of the rest of the country. I guess they're de facto providing national defense. And to some extent, this makes sense to me. I mean, if you think about like the United States, when the United States enters something that most people consider a truly defensive war, all of a sudden enlistments go up, like voluntary enlistments. They didn't just increase the pay, but all of a sudden more people want to do it because the job got more dangerous. <laughs> no, usually, right? More dangerous job commands higher pay. Now, what happens is, for other reasons, people's ideology and wanting to provide some sort of collective good with other members of society drive people to do this, and that's what we see happening in Somalia. So, one of all the pockets. We've all been waiting for Carpenter. Um, so, this is a, a plot of a number of the pirate attacks and where they've occurred. Um, doesn't the existence of widespread piracy in Somalia undermine kind of the talk that I'm giving here about Somalia's doing relatively better? No, actually. And I think it pushes you in the other way of thinking how much better Somalia's doing, particularly because of the pirates. Now, think about this. You have people who are pirates, who, by the way, the way it started, and they use this if you, if you read interviews with the pirates, this is how they justify their existence, which uh, I think is a little bit problematic. But basically, they say, listen, we were all fishermen before, which is no longer true, but the initial pirates were mostly fishermen before. They said, once we lost our national government, nobody respected our 200 miles of shoreline. So particularly Chinese fishing boats all came in and overfished. Now we have no more fish to get, so we have to do something during our livelihood. So since those boats stole from us, we now steal from these boats. Uh, now, returns to piracy have gone up, and more and more people who just had nothing to do with fishing join, join the game. In fact, there's now, by the way, there's a Somali pirate stock market. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> they, uh, so if you want to, because piracy, you know, can be a big venture, uh, and uh, they want to spread the risk around. So they have stock markets where you can go and you can buy shares of a pirate group, and you can contribute money and capital to them. They even take in-kind, so there have been cases of them taking, like, rocket launches from somebody and giving them shares in return. Um, and then if they bring in the booty, then you get a pirate too. Um, Interesting if you Google the pirate. Um, I forget where I was going before I got the stock market. Uh, why do I think it's the case that pirates actually say that Somalia is doing uh, relatively better? Here you've got a group of people who are clearly semi high time preference. They have a comparative advantage in violence. They're obviously willing to use it. But around where the pirates are actually located in particular in Puntland, this business is springing up to sell things to the newly wealthy pirates. There's even like pizza shops to sell things to the pirates to give to their hostages. <laughs> <laughs> but these pirates who have a comparative advantage in violence, if they're going to use it on pit ships passing by, why do they then all of a sudden turn over their money to people in the country and not just use violence against them? Well, I think part of the answer is, of course, the ships are worth a whole lot more. But another part of the answer is, there's a customary legal system in Somalia and there's consequences if you then commit rights violations against other Somali citizens. There's also discipline of continuous dealings in there where they know if they commit violence systematically, they're going to drive away the businesses that serve them. So they don't. But this is a system that basically a testament to if we can take this type of person, the type of person who would choose to be a pirate, and then get them to interact and respect the law within the country, then the system's pretty robust to having bad people around. Uh, so actually, my fear with piracy is that as it continues to grab headlines, that it's going to mean that the United States or another international power goes in and instills a government in Somalia to cut out the piracy. But what they're going to instill is a government then that protects U.S. and shipping interests that go by, and it's probably going to be a predatory government in the Somali, the very poor Somali people who aren't doing that well to start. Uh, I think a better answer, actually, one, I'm not sure that piracy, that it's actually efficient to get rid of the piracy that's there. So it makes headlines and such, but if you think about what enforcement costs might need to be in order to get rid of the piracy, the amount of goods actually stolen might not make sense. To you. So it could be just a problem of the world that should exist. All I'll see. Uh, another thing, actually, I gave this talk at Florida State one time, and uh, some of my UConn colleagues will appreciate. The only person uh, outside of this room, possibly, uh, who might give this type of comment when I gave this lecture, I talked about the problem of piracy. Bruce Pence. Bruce Benson's the chairman of Florida State. He raised his hand and said, well, then, go, just curious. It's like, what if just the pirates, basically, they consider it their ocean. They're too, they homesteaded that part of the water, so it's theirs. They have the right to exclude people who they don't want coming in. So they could toll people to go through their water. 
And uh, they just, because of international warships who would you know, hit them if they set up systematic toll booths, they you know, have to use this inefficient method of tolling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> only if you come from Bruce. I thought he actually had a reasonable point. I'm not sure I'm convinced yet. So, piracy, I think, is kind of a, a side issue in Somalia. It's not big internally. Uh, and interestingly, the big problem with the Somali legal system, uh, independent of pirates, is that it doesn't do a good job uh, constraining or integrating with outsiders. So if you're not part of a customary legal network, you're not protected. So their struggle, uh, while they've been trying to use this to integrate with the rest of the world and the investment in, is that for international trade, or in particular, international companies who want to make investments in Somalia, it's cumbersome of how you integrate them into the legal system. So it's no accident that these ships that are passing by that are completely outside the legal system and that nobody in the country really has a stake in time <coughs> or the ones getting credit. But beyond that, just even making investments is tough. Uh, there was a guy, uh, Frank Van Auden, who uh, lived there. He's actually married to a Somali woman. Uh, he wrote a really good book, The Law of the Somalis. Um, and uh, what he was doing when he was there is he was trying to find ways to uh, help them adapt the customary legal system to better integrate outsiders. Uh, his big thing was some version of a contractual trade zone uh, where that the particular trade zone and anybody in it comes underneath the law of a particular plan and gets tied in that way. Because it's like marriage is kind of a high transaction cost way to the legal system. Uh, <laughs> believe me. Uh, <laughs> um, and it's also no accident that this is the aspect of the legal system that's least developed because the customary legal system has been there for years, but Prior to the age of globalization, it was basically dealing with internal matters. During the globalization in the 19th century, they had Italian and British people colonizing and who handled the external affairs. So the customary legal system has continued to just do internal affairs. Then they got their nation state, which made the customary legal system illegal, but couldn't stop it from operating in the rural areas. They handled the international trade part. As a result, it's never been pushed to evolve. So this is the first time it's started to be pushed to evolve. Uh, so uh, punchline on all this is basically Somalia does fairly well in what I call a comparative institutional analysis. Given the type of state that Somalia gets and other African states get, its version of an anarchy, of having no single monopoly governing, but still having a customary system of governance, gives you a better outcome than what they were able to under achieve under a predatory state. Uh, it succeeds in providing some law and order that's the basis for this. So basically, given the ideology, culture, resources, Somalia is doing better in a state and better than many African countries that do have a government. Some implications for this from Africa, for more generally, is customary law is not unique to Somalia. There's the customary law in most parts of Africa. Now, it doesn't always have the desirable characteristics, the two particularly desirable ca characteristics of being non-geographic monopoly, so the clans are intermingled. Part of the reason for that in Somalia, I didn't mention, is that they're herders, so nomadic herders intermix. Uh, the other thing that might not necessarily be present is your ability to switch between clans without moving, which comes to the geographic mix part. Uh, those are two things that make it function particularly well. Um, but all the same, it's not unique to Somalia, so the idea that if all of a sudden the African government collapsed, you'd be in a Hobbesian war of all against all immediately, and that there'd be no focal points for law and order, it's just not there. There is customary law in many places that would provide you some focal point to get started from. Uh, George Ayi is an economist and a native of Ghana who I respect him and stuff, and he makes a big case usually that you have to distinguish between what he calls so-called modern Africa, and by that he means the Africa centered around the nation states that are there, uh, both the formal governments and basically the businesses that live off of the business of those governments and other people transferring money in. He says, and traditional Africa. And his basic take is that traditional Africa has sustained people for generations. It never had the chance to evolve and grow into a uh, a global community with international <coughs> trade. But unfortunately, most aid African, uh, efforts generally from donor governments around the world all go to prop up so-called modern Africa, which she says is incompatible with the underlying base that's already there. So we need to distinguish between the two and then look at how can we do things that would foster kind of traditional or indigenous Africa to grow and not these predatory states that are on top of this. And by me saying this, by the way, I'm not doing some there's multiple paths to development type talk. No, there's one set of institutions that we know of that generates long-term growth and prosperity. So it's some degree of respect for private property rights and individual freedom to trade economically. And I don't mean just free international trade, I mean free 
freedom to economically deal with each other <coughs> on the basis of uh, voluntary exchange. But what we have to do is get the institutions that support that to come from an indigenous base that recognizes them as valid and binding. And when you just graft modern nation states onto something and say, here, have Western property rights and rule of law, it doesn't work. And much of the efforts focus there. So what Aidi claims is, quote, the rogue African nation state should be left to the fate of deserves. <laughs> Explosion and state collapse. Provocative words. And most people, if they hear that, will say, oh my god, you get Somalia. <laughs> my answer is, it's a little bit better than what they were getting before. Um, so the challenges that come with this is just this lining up of the formal and the informal for customary law to evolve. But in this process, we have to be very modest about what so-called we in the West can do about it. This is not something where you can graft a constitution and give it to somebody else and they follow it. The U.S. Constitution has been exported all over the world and you get different outcomes, different places. The underlying culture and ideology have to match those stuff. The real game here is how do you get underlying culture and ideology in some of these places to evolve in a way that supports some sort of better off of property rights and economic freedom, whether they have a government or not. And that's a longer term process. And it's more about changing the hearts and minds of people. There's some things that we can do on the margin to help. We can't think that all of a sudden a new aid program is going to do it. Uh, one of my favorite uh, nonprofit think tanks that works on this stuff, out of Zimbabwe, what the guy does is he comes to the United States and he buys books about kind of classically liberal values of the heritage of the United States and Great Britain, particularly ones that focus on how it might be relevant for Africa, he buys them and he distributes them free at local schools. So this is a long-term battle of trying to get people's minds to change and embrace these things. The other thing that we can do on the margin is trade more freely. Free trade with the nation won't help them grow exponentially. It's a you know, shot in the arm on the margin. But here's the more important part. There's a growing literature of what we might call contagious capitalism. When a country that's more economically free trades with a country that's less economically free, over time, that makes the country that was less economically free start to become more free. So just the interaction of them like that helps to evolve. It's not a panacea, but it's at least something on the margin you can do. Uh, and also, then in the short run, as they export products and trade with us, it at least makes them a little bit wealthier. Uh, but we're fairly limited in this. But the good news, or kind of, I don't know about good news, but a policy implication of this would be, first, do no harm. And a lot of what the U.S. and I think the World Bank and others have done by propping up these predatory governments in these countries is do harm and would be better off letting some of them collapse and see. Now, I don't want to extrapolate too far from Somalia since not everybody has customary legal systems that exactly look like that. But I don't think it's much of a stretch to say regardless of what type of customary system Zimbabwe has, those people would likely be doing better if Mugabe and his government collapsed. Um, so I think that's the lesson that Somalia has for us. So we ought to be careful about how we generalize, but I do think there are broader implications for Africa that people should consider. So with that, I will uh, open it up to questions. <laughs> well, I think Jack has a microphone. Uh, I do. Oh, I don't know whether it's going to work for us or not, but we'll give it a try. If not, we'll speak loudly and clearly. <laughs> And Ben can repeat the questions. Um, <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. It's not. Oh, here it is.